So just finished a live stream and we thought, hell, let's bust out another podcast. You down with that? Hell, let's do it. Why not? He is the wind, she is the wave, and together they make up the band they call the wind and the wave. They're not related. Uh -huh. They're best buds. Uh -huh. They're BFFs for life. Hashtag BBIT dubs. It's the Dwight and Patty Show. The Dwight and Patty Show. It's the Dwight and Patty Show. It's Dwight and Patty. Welcome to episode three. Season three, episode three of the Dwight and Patty Show podcast. Oh my gosh. Um, we are happy to have you here. And um, I don't have much to talk about. I want to say something. Okay. Okay. So, you know that scenario that we were talking about last yeah. time about people cutting in line and okay. being assholes? Uh huh. And you acted like it had never happened to you in well, your lifetime. I don't, I can't recall. As an as a grown adult person, that another grown adult person has been so blatantly rude, I don't recall a time where that has happened. Mm -hmm. But I've been mulling over these scenarios in my mind for <laughs> okay. the last like week or so. Okay, and I feel like my reaction to something like that would uh, differ based on kind of like where I am mentally that day. Like if you catch me in a mood, for sure. Also. If you're transgressing against just me, different maybe from like if your kids in the car, from from my kid, or if my kids in the car, or or like if you're being a real asshole to someone else in my presence, like right. I think I might come to the defense of someone else more quickly than I would just me. Yeah, I'm glad you thought about it because that that your your answer surprised me because I know you, and you do have a quick twitch. Like you have a fuse. Yeah, sometimes. And if yeah. You, and if you are in a mood, you have a short fuse. And that fuse can be lit quite easily. And I and that's what I was saying. For me, it's about justice. Mm -hmm. If you're cutting in line at the burger joint, is it a big deal? No. Except for the fact that justice wise, everyone else is politely getting in the line. That's what we've agreed to do. Right. As a society. And if you cut in line, rules. you aren't committing an injustice to right. everyone else and i don't like that yeah. i don't like injustice mm -hmm. i don't yeah. like entitlement and i don't like injustice there some i did remember something i was at target this was a while ago but i i was at target returning something and some lady at the counter was just being really rude just I know. Oh, really I rude that. to the target employee Whose on the job other side is of the not counter. that pleasant as it is and and whatever whatever her problem was had nothing to do with whatever the job you know that other girl was trying to just do her job and had nothing to do with her anyway and i, I stood there for like 30 seconds that's all i needed to like overhear what it wasn't even what she was saying. It was the way she was saying it, you know, just her tone and her, yeah. it, it, there was entitlement in her tone. And I don't remember what I said now, but I definitely said something. I definitely said, yeah, you don't need to be talking to her that way. I definitely said something and it felt so good. Did she respond to you? Yeah. Um, I, I handled my business quickly. Like I did the, I did the return and I think I just, and then I just walked out uh, and she, I don't think she fo followed me out, but like she handled her business and quickly fought, like she did kind of follow me out of the store and, and she said something and I was just like, yeah, I don't, yeah, you just don't need to be talking like that. Yeah. Like, I don't care what the problem is. Well, I mean, is. the lady on our plane who was, who not only yelled at one flight attendant mm. and I'm talking like verbally abused, not only verbally abused one flight attendant, verbally abused Every flight attendant yeah. on the flight. Every single one. Including a guy who was just riding shotgun who wasn't working the flight. They sent a senior guy over because her TV wasn't working on an hour and 20 minute flight. I mean, dude. I think. I think. While I, she was holding a smartphone. Yeah. With free Wi-Fi. Yeah. I think I didn't say anything. One, because I have to sit next to her for the rest of the flight. Two, I was being entertained. I uh, know you were getting wicked weird pleasure out of it. I was, I was like, make it stop. Yeah. Like it was uncomfortable. The woman in front but, said something and she said, mind your yeah, fucking business. I know. And, but that, 
that part was so entertaining. Yeah. Like I was just like, oh my god, the I can't believe. The woman in front was like, hey, we don't have a TV either. Yeah, I, I uh, yeah, it was just it was it was weirdly entertaining, un- uncomfortably so. But also, you know, I, we may have talked about this, but like I said, if that woman had said to me, hey, I noticed you're watching your phone. Mm. Would you mind if I switch seats with you and use your TV? Sure. No problem. Mm-hmm. You can have it. All she had to do was ask. She didn't want that, though. No, she wanted, she wanted to her complain. TV to work. She wanted to complain. And if she did, and if it didn't, she wanted to know what they were going to do. Because she went directly to the counter when we got off the plane to bitch some more. Well, because to the, the people last on thing. the ground. Well, because the last thing that guy... The, the flight attendant told her was like, w- would you like to, you know, and then she said, okay, like it was, that was a planned thing for her to go talk to them at the, at the, yeah, counter. my like, thing is, is, and I've, you know, I've thought about that situation in lots of situations. I really wish that they had another option. Mm-hmm. I wish their option yeah. was, Hey, we're really sorry for this inconvenience. We will give you a voucher for a free flight. Here, here's your voucher. In the domestic U S here you go. You only get this though. If you stop complaining, <laughs> Right. Seriously. Right. Like, if you're willing to let this go, here's a free flight in the future, right. which would cost them nothing. Mm-hmm. Really nothing. It's a $150 flight. to. Right. It was a nothing flight. Here's a free voucher and this value to another place in the continental U.S. Uh, the t- you can use it the next year. I hope her TV on flights never works yeah, again. Yeah, it would just be like, that would be an easy way for them to de-escalate. I would hope right. that airlines are providing a way other than... Well, I don't, you know, I reset it. I don't know. That's right. all they could say was I reset it. Right. You know, it's like give them another option. Give them something they can offer right. to these idiots. All right. Anyway. Anyway. I'm glad you rethought about that. Uh, yeah. I have been thinking about, I know last week I, it was either last podcast or the podcast before I talked about that I had been dissatisfied with my job and then found some pleasure recently with it. And then... Even more so recently, I remembered the impact that music has on my life. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was just going to, and I, as I'm talking about it, maybe you could, th- I want you to listen to me, but also maybe you could think about if you've had a, a similar moment. There's a record for me that when people ask me a top five of all albums of all time or a top 10, it's hard for me to give because that could change moment to moment and mm-hmm. year to year. But there's one for me that always stays there. It's a record that if you put on, I'm like, yeah, let that go. Let it go. And that's Grace by Jeff Buckley. That record for me um, came at a time I had just moved to Austin in 94. 95 when it dropped I think um, I was a little lost musically I was coming off of doing a bunch of pop tours and um, as a drummer and I was living in Austin for the first time and I was living with some old buddies and that was nice over on the east side and um down by 45th on the east side, kind of a shitty neighborhood and a shitty little house on Hollywood Ave, hmm. which is kind of interesting, hmm. but um, which is a really nice little neighborhood now over by that Fiesta, but it's not, wasn't so nice then. And um, I had just moved back from the east coast and I felt like a certain amount of freedom here in Austin because Austin at that time was just the Wild West and you could live for, I mean, we were in a four bedroom house for like $800 crazy yeah and it was a big house with you know it was a shitty house but it was a big big house spacious yeah tons of room big front porch um and and one of the guys i lived with um was good friends with matt johnson who was the drummer on that grace record jeff buckley record and he grew up in houston with us and i knew matt sort of we were acquaintances I doubt he would remember me, but I remember him. He was like a year older than me. He was a drummer, and I thought he was the shit. There were two guys in town that I thought were the shit, him and this guy named Chris Dave, who's gone on to play with. Chris Dave. Yeah. Do you know Chris Dave? No, I just, two his, first name, names, yeah. just his name, Chris, Chris Dave. Chris Dave has gone on to play with, you know, Erica Badu and Beyonce and all kinds of incredible player. So there were these two guys that I, I was never going to be that good, I thought, as a drummer. 
that I really looked up to, and I don't know if they really knew my name, but I knew them. And we probably passed in parties or gigs or whatever around Houston, but my friend went to high school with Matt at uh, Houston, uh, high school for, high school for, for the Performing and Visual Arts, HSPVA, okay. in Houston, which I wanted to go to and got into, but my mother would, wouldn't let me go. Um, another story, but... Um, which is her right. She wanted me to have a education, not already just be music focused, mm-hmm. which was probably good in retrospect. And as my career has turned out, obviously I didn't need to go to HSPVA to make it. Sure. I thought I did. Sure. Um, but anyway, so this guy was the drummer at HSPVA, a uh, jazz player. And then, so I was living, my friend's name was Gus Montanati and I was living with him and my other buddy named Chico, Chico Jones. And, uh, we, had a little band, but Gus, I remember one day he goes, hey, because Jeff Buckley had not broken out. It had not, there was no hype about Jeff Buckley. It was a weird record. And he goes, hey, my buddy's coming through on tour with this guy he's playing with, with named Jeff Buckley. We should go. And I was like, okay. And just go watch the show. Yeah, we yeah. should go. I was like, can we like get the record to listen to? And he was like, yeah, he sent it to me. He'd sent him the vinyl record. So Gus and I took mushrooms. On we, As you do. As you do. We made them into chocolate shakes. That sounds yucky. It was delicious. <laughs> okay. It was a delicious way to take mushrooms. Okay. And I think we even put some on some pizza and ate them that way. I have done that. Yeah. And... Uh, like we took too many probably, but <laughs> but we let the record, the needle drop on that record. And we had a decent system there, you know, kind of an old school hi-fi vinyl system because, you know, vinyl was still pretty big. I know it's bigger again now, but at the time it was just CDs and vinyl were still kind of fighting for that superiority and even in 95. And... That mojo pin sound, that warbly mm-hmm. sound that starts mojo pin comes up. And we had the lights off. And it and it wasn't just the mushrooms, by the way, because I wasn't fully fucking baked when it hit. I probably was baked towards the end of it, but it blew me out of the water. It's this really visceral, raw recording. There's not a lot of tricks on that record. There's some reverb and a little delay on his guitar. The vocal is either reverb or dry. And it was just, and it's very weird progressions. It's very weird tunings. It was like no, it was like a Zeppelin record. It was like nothing I had heard. And it moved me like heavily like I was like oh shit this is one of the greatest records ever made of all time and when someone's just like hey let's go see my friend Mm -hmm. you're like okay Okay, let's listen to it let's get high Mm -hmm. and then we'll fucking go wander around town and try to get laid it was incredible like it was so moving that we were both now this was probably the mushrooms crying oh yeah when it hit Hallelujah, we were crying. So this wasn't the time where you were stuck between the bed and the wall. <laughs> no, that was another time. Okay. <laughs> there were a few mushrooms <laughs> around that. Um, but it, we were crying. It was so moving that we started it again, and we listened all the way through a second time. Did you make the show? Show was another night. Oh, okay. This was okay. like we okay. were like getting ourselves, like we wanted to know what we were going to see. Got it, got it. I have three moments I'm going to talk about, actually. You may have none, but I'm going to, this is what the podcast is going to be about. And then we're going to go home because I want to watch football. It blew me away. We went and saw the show. I don't even know. Could have been a year later. It could have been a week later. I really don't know. It was probably like a week later. And my Austin friends will have to correct me. I want to say the place was called the Electric Lounge. It was a tiny place. It probably packed could hold 100 people, you know? Mm-hmm. maybe i mean it was not a big place it was not like a, the level of a record that you heard there should have been played you know that i heard should have been played and electric lounge is that what it was 
Yeah, I'm seeing it here. Well, it doesn't exist anymore. Well, I know, but just, you know. Yeah, that's what it was. Yeah. Okay, so we went, and Jeff Buckley walked out. First off, he's a fantastic-looking boy. He's a very handsome boy. He walked out with a Telecaster, a yellow Telecaster, and the there no one was there to see Jeff Buckley. Or not it couldn't have been many people that even knew who he was. He was was he opening for someone? He was just there himself. Oh, he was just there. There may have been an opening band. He may have been opening. Honestly, I can't remember. People would have to call me out. But what he did was no one was paying attention because it was just a bar. You know, it was like a bar. <laughs> yeah, he he he's cute. Yeah. Yeah, he's where, cute. Where people just went to drink. Yeah, his hair was all tousled. You know what I mean? He looked like he was just out of bed. Yeah. Yeah. White t-shirt, very 90s, white t-shirt, blue jeans, yeah. boots, you know, or something like <laughs> mm -hmm. that. He walked out by himself. There were all the other instruments, the bass, the guitar, the drums, and he walked out by himself. And what's the song where he goes, ooh, I'm lying in my bed, the blanket is warm. God, it won't keep me safe. Won't, what song is that? Seriously? Yeah. I don't know. So whatever song that is has this like doodle doodle. It might be Mojo, but it has doodle 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 doodle. Right? Mm -hmm. He did that ooh, quietly for a while, and I watched a room full of people who couldn't give a fuck who was about to play. Just slowly stop talking and turn towards this God <laughs> and move towards the stage. Like he was like the Pied Piper. He was like, you're going to listen to this. We're going to have a moment. It That's is, what we're going to do here. It is Mojo Pin. Okay. He didn't say a fucking word, by the way. He just played until people paid attention. Didn't introduce himself or anything. Just started playing songs. He never talked the whole night. Wow. Yeah. He didn't say a goddamn word. What's there to say? But by the time, I mean, and I watched girls, once they realized the cute boy that was on stage also crooning in a falsetto, also playing this brilliant guitar part, go like, oh, I'm in, I'm in love. <laughs> this is the whole thing. And I was in love. Yeah. And they played a show that was just a bar show, but so great. Just so great. So great. Bar shows can be so great and can be so bad. <laughs> Yeah, well, it that was an incredible moment for me, and and what brought that up was I saw an old interview with Matt Johnson the other day, and this has been thirty years since that record came out now almost, but it was like I think on the twentieth year anniversary or something. And he was just talking about how young they all were and the green they all were, and they didn't even know they had made an incredible record, and um and how sad you know Jeff Buckley essentially put out one record, you know there's a live. EP that's from Sine, which was a place in, in Manhattan, a little club in Manhattan. And, and there was a demo release after his death. But his whole vibe, his whole existence is on this one set of songs. And his legacy. Dude, if you go to Spotify, the dude still has three million listeners. Those songs have hundreds of millions of plays. Like, one record is the whole thing. And it's such a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant record. Lover You Should Have Come Over is... <laughs> that song is so incredible about the end of a relationship. And it's like, if you had to come over, maybe we could have fixed it. Which reminds me of you and Kevin. Mm. You know? It's like, maybe just don't let go. Maybe fight for it for a second. You know? So, I'm sorry. Jeff Buckley died in a drowning accident that in didn't the involve any drugs or alcohol? Nope. He was he was kind of an adventurous soul, apparently, to all people. Just kind of a, yeah, let's go climb that mountain. Yeah, let's go get in that river. And he got in the river in Memphis, Tennessee, and that river moves. Oh, no. It's the Mississippi River, I think, and it moves. And he got sucked under, and it was in the night, and no, yeah. one, no one of his friends could find him. He was dead. Oh, my God. That's he how was we, found, though. He, yeah, the body they, was found they, downstream, yeah. but yeah. Oh my god. Yep. Because the first thing I think, 
of like a, a musician or an artist dying, the first thing in my mind is like, Drug. oh, drugs or alcohol. I mean, I'm sure he experimented. I'm sure he had, but it wasn't. That was not it what was involved. Yeah, it it was a fast moving <laughs> river that he couldn't. He shouldn't have been in. That's crazy. Yep. How old was he when he died? He died in 97. He was 30 years old. It's crazy. I also love that, you know, Buckley wasn't one of those guys that was discovered when he was 19. You know, he was discovered when he was 28. He was a session guitarist. Yeah, but I mean, he was discovered when he was 27, 28 years old is when he found his own voice, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, I think that's incredible. And he found it through playing lots of covers and stuff, which is why Hallelujah is on there. It's why Corpus Christi Carol's on there, because he had all these weird covers he did, too, you know? I didn't know he had one record. Yeah. That's insane. Yeah, because that other record is uh, demos. And his story is just, like, just fast and just a whirlwind. Yep. Yep. Crazy. And it felt like one of those records that was a secret. Like you, it wasn't the biggest record in the right. world, but but in Europe it was doing really well apparently, and around the world it was doing better than, than it would in the U.S. because the U.S. wasn't smart enough for it probably, and it just felt like you knew something that other people didn't know, you know, like oh you guys don't know about Jeff Buckley, oh you guys don't know about Jeff Buckley, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. like you're in on the yeah you're in on yeah, yeah. uh. So that's mine. Do you have a sto- do you have a story about what made you love music or or that something like that? I don't really even know how to define what I'm talking about, but just a, where music just was like, oh, this is everything to me. Um, on the spot like this, I I don't I don't really have like a a story like that. No. Really. I mean, you're, you're you are kind of putting me on the spot here. Hundred percent, but don't. you don't you don't have any moments even where like you brought home transatlanticism and put on your headphones and listen to the blankets in your room or any like you don't have anything like that. I have millions of. But I mean, I have a, lots. But of, not a not a moment moment where you actually remember on it. the spot like this. No, I don't. I don't think Cause I because I, I have maybe it'll be something you'll bring up next podcast like you just did when you thought about the other things. But I have another one. Uh, which is Cure Disintegration, uh, the Cure Disintegration. If anyone knows me, they know the Cure is one of my favorite bands, if not my favorite of all time. And the Cure Disintegration record was the first CD I ever got. See, I remember weird shit like that. Mm. It was the first compact disc I ever owned. I had only owned vinyl up to that moment. What about tapes? Uh, Tons of tapes, too. Yeah, Tapes were in my truck. Vinyl in my house. Okay. And uh, this is the first compact disc, and my parents had gotten me a one-disc changer to add on to my little stereo system in the little cabinet, you know, that you had in the 90s. And um, uh, and so I needed a CD, and that record was coming out, and, and my buddy Chad Sells and I were friends with the guys that owned, um, I'm drawing a blank on what that record shop is called, it was on in uh, Houston. Yeah, it was on Shepherd Avenue. Mm. It had all the cool imports. And at the time the cure was still an import, even though they were a big band, they would show up in the import section, you know? Mm-hmm. So uh they gave it they gave Chad and I a version of that record the day before it was released. So the day before they were going to put it on the shelves, we got a copy of that. And I took it home and I put on headphones. Black Dog Records and nope. CDs? No, nope. it doesn't exist anymore. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's just closed. Yeah, it doesn't exist anymore. Okay. If you said it, I would remember it, but it wasn't that. Okay. Um, and we listened to it. I, I listened to it. I took it home and put on that CD. First off, the CD was a whole different vibe at the time because the quality was so different than vinyl. It sounded so different and clear. But it, for that record, it was perfect. And I listened to Disintegration on those big Mickey Mouse white headphones that I had in my bed from like 8 at night until the next morning. I don't even think I went to sleep. I listened to it over 
and over and over again. All night. I listen to one record all night long. I, yeah, I do that. Trying to figure out, like, how did they, how do, how do those drums sound like that? This is the first time they, they'd always use keyboards, but this record had giant synths in it and stuff. And I was just blown away. Um, and I would do these things where I would lay in bed. I was probably 16 then or 17. I would lay in bed and picture myself in the band. I always did that with you oh, two, lots sure. of bands. I'd always be like, well, the drummer's going to break his arm and they're going to need a drummer and they're going to call me. <laughs> and then that's going to be me and I'm going to have my hair all poofed up and I'm going to be fucking doing it. Yeah. You know, and just fantasizing about being in something that cool. Absolutely. They were so mysterious to me, you know. Yeah, I had a big mirror above my dresser and I used to like basically be in star in music videos. You were also Sh Shania Twain. Oh, yeah. And <laughs> Celine Dion. Yeah. But also TLC. Huh? I had a cassette. Don't go chasing waterfall. Yeah, I had a cassette of TLC. Yeah. Um. Yeah, uh, that moment too blew me away. And I got one more if you want it. I don't not want it. This is a concert moment. Also in Austin. <clears throat> also around that same time, to be honest. And how old were you? <sighs> 25 they all happen around this time yeah because right? it's just it's such an important yes pivotal point 15 in to 25 yeah. is where you really kind of figure out who you are artistically i think yeah. um who your tribe is mm -hmm. i went and saw a tour that had helmet was the headliner you probably don't know them had another band in the middle slot called quicksand which i loved at the time they had a record called slip with that was the shit Heavier stuff. And then opening was Rage Against the Machine, which no one knew who that was. Okay? Okay. So Rage Against the Machine, Quicksand, Helmet. I was there for Quicksand. I was fine to see Helmet because I thought they had a cool record too called Meantime. And Rage Against the Machine, no one knew who they was. But back in those days, if there was an opener, you went. You, 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 went, you, went, and saw, you went and saw the whole show. Get it, your money's worth. That's right. You had to pay a lot to go or a lot for those times and, yeah. and you were going to get your money's worth plus those days shows were a physical thing there was a pit people were stage diving it was like you wanted to you're a kid you wanted to be fucking in it mm -hmm. you know what i mean so i showed up in my cargo shorts and no shirt you know just like you're ready to go to a goddamn show with my bleached out hair and long hair and i was buff and ripped up and it was fun i was ready to go let's do this show ready to fight <laughs> let's do this show you know what i mean and um it was a place called Liberty Lunch. I don't think... Uh, we probably wouldn't have been friends. No. No. Well. You, the reason we wouldn't have been friends, though, is because you were so shy and in your own shell and weren't sure who you were and your fa family had crippled you. That's why you weren't friends with John Bauman. You weren't friends because... You, what? You were friends with Christian people. That's not true. Not all my friends were Christian. I had plenty of friends that did not go to church. I, I actually think you would have liked me a lot. You think? Mm -hmm. You would have probably had a crush on me. It's fine. Anyway, <laughs> I go to this show, and and I, I probably would have had a crush on you, mousy little girl, you cutie. Yeah, absolutely. We would have been friends. All We're right. both into music. Okay. We're both into music, because I was also I was not only a football player, I was in band, too. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, you I in played band. in bands. I played shows. Yeah, I just feel like you would have been too cool for me i wasn't very cool. yeah well that's what i'm saying so that would have been the shy thing but i was not i was outgoing okay i would have said hey okay if you had to come to the show and i knew you had come to the show i'd have said hey even if i didn't want to have sex with you yeah we for just, i had just been dude, friends i've always had girlfriends i like girls more than boys All i right. do i i was raised by i like girls okay tons of sisters i like girls i communicate better with women mm -hmm. anyway so we go to the show and we're going to see the opener and Rage Against the Machine comes on and this was that first record with all that fuck you, I won't do what you tell me. All that just like incredible, viscerally angry protest songs, but also super groove, super heavy, big drops. And dude, I don't know if everyone else knew about them and I didn't, I have no idea. But they hit the stage and hit that stage so goddamn hard. 
that by the end of their set, which was probably only 45 minutes, the place was toast. It was an indoor outdoor venue, and that place was on like it was sweaty mm-hmm. and humid and on fire. Like people were like exhausted in a good way before the other two bands even had a chance. Yes. And you could tell that it had been happening every night, right? Because Quicksand came on and did their job, uh-huh. but they knew they had no chance, right? Because here's the thing: Rage Against the Machine at their best was probably hard to beat live on stage. I have to believe it. They were in. Incredible. You can't let that band open for no. you. I think it's probably why they became a headliner so quick because people were like, I'm not letting Rage Against the Machine open for me. I can't play after that. Yeah. So I, I was listening to Bob talk about op- um, openers uh-huh. recently. Yeah. And he says he does not watch openers because it can only yield bad things. You know, says. that's me too. Yeah. He's, you know, do you know that? You know, that's I mean, me. Yeah, I know. He, well, because he's like, and it makes sense. He's like, because they're either really good mm-hmm. and then you feel like you're fucked mm-hmm. or they're bad and you've just. And then wait. you feel like you have to pick up the pieces. Yeah. And then, and you know, I don't, and he's like, I don't want to watch it if it's bad. So. Yeah. And if it's good, you're like, oh, God damn it. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. But we've talked about that before. And this is nothing about anyone who we've hired to open for us, by the way, if you listen to this. But. We've always tried to hire someone who's not going to be better than us. We've had some opportunities to have someone open where we've thought, that good. person's <laughs> real good. <laughs> I don't know if we should have them play with us because we, uh, are we that good? That being said, we've had some really great openers. We have. Um, it's, people it's, that we've like really made good friendships with. Yeah, there's some times we've have, had to step the fuck up. People that have really good songs. And... Yeah, I mean, that was early on. It ended where we started having just great people. And it was like, because I remember Jesse was always tough to follow. Yeah. Uh, what's her face? Haley? Mm-hmm. Such a powerhouse vocally. An incredible voice, yeah. And she would go hard. I saw her singing with Katie Tunstall the other yeah, day. Yeah, she was, she was going hard. Yeah, yeah. Like, she she was coming for the crown, you she know what I mean? She always does. And, and it was like, oh, shit, we got to, like, fucking show up tonight. Mm-hmm. Because we're kind of a casual show, yeah. just like we are this, just like we are uh, in concert. It's just, uh, it's kind of like, yeah, let's see what happens. Oh, it's just Dwight and and, Patty. and the and she's a goddamn star, right? You know what yeah, I mean? For so, sure. So, you know. Anyway, I wish you had a moment you could remember because I was really excited to hear if there was like a moment where you were like, oh, this is what I'm gonna do, like a concert or a. You never had that moment. I never had the moment where I was like, this is what I'm going to do. Because I don't even I've think never... you still think that. You because still don't think this I've is what you're going to do. I've never believed. How? I've never believed this You've is what I was going to do. You've had four record deals. How? I just keep getting lucky and lucky. And I just keep yep, getting lucky. Yep, it's all luck. I just keep yep. getting super lucky. That is so sad to me. That really is so sad to me. I mean, I think, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Imagine what you're capable of if you believed in yourself. It's not that I don't, it's just like something, something must have happened or, or, you know, I got real or something and, and, and decided like that was not, that was too dreamy or something. But like for a long time. You needed a real job, you mean? Yeah, yeah. But like, but like for a long time, I I dreamt for a long time. Okay. Well, when, okay, well, I'm just going to try to get to a story then. In the mirror, in my bedroom. When did you join your first band that played gigs? In college. Was that the soldier thing? Yeah. How did that happen? How did you seek it out? What made you seek that out? What? What made you seek what? that? What made what? you seek that out? Um, well, I didn't. I'll start there. I didn't okay. seek out to be in a band. Okay. Um, something possessed me to uh, do the talent show. At Texas State. There was a talent show at Texas State. And something made you Some, think, I'm supposed to be up there. Something possessed me that I was supposed to get on stage by myself with a guitar and sing a cover song. Okay. That's what I did. What song? Please tell me you remember. I think it I think it was Brown Eyed Girl. I mean, you went with a bar song. So crazy. Okay. I think it was Brown okay. Eyed Girl. I could be wrong. Give him my brown eyed girl. Okay. Yeah. I mean, one of the greatest songs ever written. Like one of I, the most overcovered songs ever. Pretty sure that's what I sang. Um, and Ryan Littman mm-hmm. 
saw me there. Who's you know love he, Ryan Littman. He's a great person. He's good he's mixer. Out, he's, he's out, out the, doing the thing. He's yeah. doing the thing in L.A. Um, he was there. I forget in what capacity. I'm sure he was maybe like helping run sound probably. or something. Yeah, probably. Um, or he may have put it on. Yeah, I I can't remember he exactly. Like that kind of guy. But so yeah, so we were so yeah. I I guess I maybe maybe briefly met him there, um, and then he was I think in the you know sound engineering program there at Texas State. That's a really good program. It is. And yeah, and then and then he was helping out Justin and Todd um make some music in the studio there the i think the fire station studios Mm -hmm. and then they were like well we need a female like backup singer or something backup not well harmonies they wanted some female Mm -hmm. vocal stuff and ryan was like well i saw this girl Mm -hmm. i'm gonna i'm gonna reach out because i think she has a good voice you know and so ryan's the one that kind of put us together and then i sang on some stuff and (laughs) I just remember singing on some stuff and then them being like, so do you want to be in our band? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And I like somehow became the lead singer of that band. Do you ever wonder? Because I wonder sometimes like if my mother hadn't brought home that drum kit or whatever, like if you hadn't done that talent show, do you still think you would have music in your life other than as a fan? I'm going to say yes, because even though it's hard for me to be like, yeah, I'm talented and I'm going to do this. I've never been like that. Um, I've always sought it out in ways. I've always surrounded myself with people that are seeking out the same thing. Or at least a creative life. Yeah. Like I... I think I always kind of have put myself in those situations and I'm meeting people and I'm saying yes to things. And You would have continued maybe to do, to put something. yourself in those situations. Yeah, even if it wasn't with you. Well, because or... you had a plan to be a music writer, correct? If it, if it, if you weren't going to be, you were going to be around it either way. I was going to be around it. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I find that fascinating that you were going to be a music writer because you were like, oh, I'm going to be around it. Yeah, you know? yeah, I want to be in this world one way or another. Like, I, I was a big fan of music, so one way or another, I was going to be around it. I was going to be hanging out with people that were making the music, and I was going to be writing mm. about their music. I was going to be, you know, covering their their concerts and all mm. that stuff. But, but I like, I also remember, like, I bought my first guitar. Like, I... In college? No, I was in high school. Okay. And I was... Uh, you remember what kind of guitar it was? A Takamini. Okay. <laughs> it was what I could afford. Yep. Um, and like to me, it was really nice. Yeah, dude. I you mean, know? your first guitar is, is nice. Like I, period. I was in high school. I was working after high school every day. I was saving my money, and I just remember, like, okay, I, I have, I think I have enough money, and I just like went to the store. It was in San Antonio picked out one that I thought looked good, mm-hmm. good enough. Because you didn't know what played good. Good enough. Just what looked cool to you. Yeah, yeah. put my hands on it, and I'll figure out. Mm-hmm. I, I, I knew I knew some chords. Okay. And it, I, I do remember the feeling of, like, buying my own guitar, and it, I do remember feeling, like, so good. It was the first time I ever, like, spent that much money on something that was totally my choice without anyone's permission. Do you know what I mean? That was a really good feeling. Yeah, it's like it's interesting though because you've never had that aha moment, but I think mainly because of that traumatic childhood where you weren't really taught to believe in yourself, and so you weren't ever allowed to dream. You know, dreaming was like that's what you do when you're a kid, but once you're in college, it's time to get a real fucking job, and you're not. Whereas, man, I've dreamed my whole life. I've always dreamed. I've always thought of something bigger. Yeah. You know what I mean? I always. Think, yeah, I don't know. I mean, my like my dad's an artist. I don't think. Um, yeah, I don't think he's he an insurance man who also is an artist. Do you see what I'm saying? I'm not. My dad is an artist. I don't not, think he I, he's ever, a great painter. I'm not saying he's not an artist. What I'm saying is an insurance man first. 
How long? You told me he didn't paint for how many years? No, no, I know, but just let me finish. Okay. I, my dad is an artist, and I don't think that he allowed himself to dream for whatever reason. Maybe it was his dad. Same, oh, it was the exact same reason. Or something. It was the exact um, same reason. You know, I don't, I don't really know. Um, I, I've tried to get into that, and I don't think he really likes to talk about it. He may not have the emotional space he to do it. He might not even know. Yeah, he may not know? have the space to do it. But I think, I think definitely, like, when he had kids, he was like, okay, I got to, you know, be a man. I've got to provide. I've got to. It's like, but when I, I mean, I was already sort of successful when I had my first kid, but also I had this moment where I was like, oh, I'm going to be a bigger artist. Mm to pay for things. Do you know what I mean? Right. It wasn't like, now I need to, now I need to buckle down and get it. It was like, Oh, well now I need to play arenas. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. I don't know. I've just always kind of been like this, like, Oh, I can, I can make it in that. Yeah. You know? Well, it, what's interesting is he still doesn't, I don't think he's, he still doesn't really like view himself as an artist. I, I know that. I talk. Hey, I, I had a loud conversation like he's, with your dad. The like other he's day, really including good, including about his painting. By really? the way, really, yeah, like 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 he is really good. He but said, "I allow." He said, and I quote, "I allow myself one show a year. I allow myself one show a year. Like go to to that pers- he puts his paintings out. Yeah. I said, "Well, why don't you do one a month?" He said, "Oh." Well, it's work. It is work. Yeah, but and I mean, with the same paint, it doesn't matter, <laughs> right? You know what I mean? It's like. You can do as many you want. Because he's also telling me at the same time that he has young employees that do all his work for him now, and he's really worked it out where he doesn't have to work at all. Yeah, he doesn't really work that much. And it's like, like, okay, well, if you've worked it out where you're making the same money not having to work, you should just be doing art shows. It -hmm. brings you pleasure. He's like, yeah, I like like to be noticed. That's what he said. (laughs) I like to be noticed. Do more shows, you know? He's just got that thing in him. It's that thing that holds a lot of people back. From a creative life, it's fear of being on the street, it's I guess. It's a lot of fear. It's a lot of fear. So, yeah. I mean, I don't know. I, uh, well, I'm i glad you shared that. I, I For me, it's like a, it's important for me to know, like, I mean, obviously, the luckiest day of your life is the day you met me, and I'm sure. <laughs> obviously. I'm sure you remember that. Do you remember the day you met me? I do. It was at dinner. Sushi. What did you think the first moment We've you We've talked met? about this? Not on a podcast, we haven't. Well. I want to know. We may have. I wanted to want to know what you thought about, like, me as a person who was about to produce your record. Well, before I met you, I was already intimidated. Because I felt like, oh, we're going to meet a producer. And going to a real studio, right? We're going to go out to dinner. and Right. I have to, like, he has to like me. Mm-hmm. Had you had you even heard like me sing at all even before you met me? I'd gone with Casey McPherson oh, to watch right. a show Antones. at Antones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you were very good. I didn't think they let you sing enough, and I said that at the first meeting. I said, "Why aren't we using that voice as the main instrument?" <laughs> <laughs> it's all you guys have. Um, no, there was a great thing y'all had. It's just yeah. like, why are we? Why is she singing for a minute in a song, mm-hmm. and then the song is five minutes long? Right. I want her to sing for three and a half minutes, and then you could still do all your dream shit. Right. But I want her to sing more. You mm-hmm. know. Mm-hmm. You was right. You was right. Yeah, I remember feeling like going to that dinner and feeling nervous, like I had to prove something. Mm. You know what I mean? Like I think that's person, healthy. This person has to like me. You do though. Yeah. At a meeting like that, you do got to show. You yeah. do got to show up. Yeah. You know, you can't just be, because if you're meeting someone in that, in a creative idea, especially a producer, it's like they want to believe that you believe you should be there. It's hard to work with someone, even if they're great, if they don't believe. It's inter- You're an interesting case because... <laughs> You are because Case. at the same time, like you don't at this all the time that you don't believe in yourself, you carry yourself with an incredible it's a constant, confidence. It's a constant push and pull. Even when you didn't like yourself, you carried yourself with an incredible like I know what I'm doing, confidence, and it's it's like having the imposter <laughs> syndrome and fighting and and like resisting it and fighting it as hard as you can at the same time. Totally being being, being really really afraid. 
and then pretending just pretending that you're fucking not yeah you know yeah yeah at the same like at the same time so yeah it's a weird thing i mean i have that too as a producer i i listen back to work i've done i try not to because it, this always happens i listen back to work i've done three years ago and i'm like ugh, what the fuck was i doing where I thought it was probably pretty great at the time. I was like, what am I doing? Well, what's, what am I doing with that snare drum there? God damn, that sounds terrible. You know, on some record that people really like, you like know, or whatever. three years ago from now? Yeah, I just oh. don't listen to my old stuff anymore mm. because I'm going to do that imposter too, syndrome thing. That thing where I'm just like, what are you, what you, should you even be doing this? You know what I mean? Same sort of thing. It's like, yeah. I have two homes and I make a great living and it's like I'm questioning whether or not I belong here. That's fucking insanity. That's an insane person's thought, you know. Yeah. But pretty common I, I think in I'm, the artistic yeah. world. I'm I'm right in the middle because I can at the same times like hear that voice that says, I'm sure you should be here right now. And then the other voice that's like, fuck yes, I should be here right now. At yeah, the same time. It's very interesting. Like, for instance, when we're in an arena we're about to walk on. And when we do arenas, it's me and you usually. Mm-hmm. You have this like uh, thing where you could tell you're nervous. And then it's like the lights go up or the, uh, where the our intro music ends. And you strut onto stage. You like walk powerfully like, all right, let's do this. It's my stage. Yeah, it's interesting. That that that's what I mean. I well, guess you really are two people. Well, sometimes that that like puts you. It you know it sets the tone, like the lights, the stage, the da 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 da. It's all there, you know. So then it just kind of like. Do you ever have moments? You do you ever way? have moments after? I feel like you know that I'm spoiled a little bit. Like it's almost like old hat for me. I've toured for so long that I get back in the tour bus and it's just like another day sometimes. But do you ever have moments where you get back in the tour bus after we've played in front of 25,000 people and sung acoustic songs? When you get in your bus bunk and you shut that, you shut that fucking blind, you ever think like, holy shit, I'm in Aberdeen, Scotland. Yeah, no, for sure. You do? Yeah, absolutely. You do have those thoughts? You're aware of that, those moments? Yeah, but at, but again, at the same time, I can, you know, I'm in, in the tour bus, you know, popping popcorn, getting in my bunk, whatever it is. At the same time, I'm having this thought like, I can't believe I just did that. Right. And I'm going to do it again tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At the same time, it's it does feel like just another day. See, the two sides of me are... I can't believe I just did that. And my other side is my cocky side. Mm-hmm. That's my other side. Right. My other side is my, well, I, of course I, I mean. Of course I did that. Of course I did that. I write amazing songs that should be heard. Of course I should be, I should be bigger. I shouldn't <laughs> be opening this show. I should be headlining the show. <laughs> yeah. Like that's part of my thought yeah. is like, why don't people get what we do even more? Right. You know what I'm more saying? More people. Why are we not Coldplay? Yeah. I, I always think that. Mm-hmm. That's the other side of me, which maybe that's totally fucked up. I don't know. No, I think you need it. I think you need it. Yeah. Well, I mean, because part of my job is to instill confidence in people going out with their record, you know, Mm -hmm. leaving here. It's like, I want people, I want more artists to believe in their music. So many people are like, well, let me play it for my manager. Yeah, it's like, dude, (laughs) who gives a fuck what your manager thinks? Do you love it? Do you like it? Then that's all that matters. Mm-hmm. And if your manager doesn't, hey, fire them. <laughs> yeah. And get a new manager who loves what you do. Right. If you love what you do, that's the only thing. It's the only thing. Everything else is Ugh, a bonus. It's so frustrating yeah. when I hear that. I hate that. Do you get that a lot here in the studio? All the time. All the time people want their team to like it. And I'm like, you go into your team. You tell them what to it, like. I, I'm always like, do you love it? They're like, oh, dude, this is the best shit I've ever done. I'm like, then you take this and you go in and you go, this Here's, is the best shit I've ever done. It's it hot is. and I love it. Right. Mm-hmm. That's it. Right. <laughs> and if they have the balls to say anything other than that to your face. Yeah. You know? If they're going to say anything after you say that, which they're not. Right. Most of these people are failed writers and musicians that are in those positions and if you tell them it's great, you know what they're going to usually say? Yeah. You're right, artist one. You, It is great. Let's go talk to the label and tell them how amazing it is. Then they call and they're like, oh, man, I just heard the new da-da-da. He just played it for me. It's the best shit he's ever done. They'll quote you. Yeah. 
It, they'll quote you. <laughs> Can we go watch football? Yeah, I guess. Can I go watch football? What's Do you have anything first, else to talk about? What's the first game? I don't even know. You don't even know. I think it's the 49ers game. Mm. 49ers Rams, I think. That's that's what the rest of your day looks like today. Oh yeah. Just that. Just I mean, pizza yours too, your husband. Football. Hello. I know that football is going to be on in my house and I like it. That's his team. I like football yeah. on in my house even if I don't know what the heck Sarah, is going on. Sarah likes it in the background too. She she prefers golf or basketball, but she likes those sounds. I know. do. I like the sounds. She likes the squeaking shoes in basketball and the sounds that they pump in of birds and shit in golf. Reminds her of her dad. <laughs> did we talk about that here? We're like someone, or did I like hear it somewhere somewhere else where like someone called in and they were upset about uh, the wrong bird sounds being oh, played? At the... that, we didn't talk about that, but that's hilarious. <laughs> that's funny, right? They do do that. I know. I know. And that, someone... that, that red-faced warbler is not a, yeah. indigenous to Georgia. <laughs> yeah. It would never be on Augusta. Are you, what are you, insane? <laughs> that really happened. It's like, dude, your life sucks. That really happened. Your life sucks. Anyway, thank you for joining us on another podcast. We have some streams coming up we'll talk about and announce soon. Also, we have Patreon. Also, we have Patreon, patreon.com slash the wind and the wave. Join us there for unreleased new songs, demos, lyrics, and more. Um, if you're in Austin on February 17th. Come- 2022. Well, yeah, 2022. Well, someone might listen to this five years from now. Oh, okay. Sorry. If, well, if you're, on, if you're in Austin on... On February 17th, 2022, <laughs> come out to the Saxon Pub and watch us play a sad, sad, sad show. Mm, and sad. sad, super sad. And uh, yeah, that's it. I'm looking forward to finding out if we are, if we are allegedly going to the UK We're in going. February. We're going. Though, I don't know how they're going to get us a ticket. I haven't gotten it yet. I so. mean, they understand that if I'm not sitting in the window, I'm not going. They understand that, right? I don't know if Dan knows that, so we need to. You make, should probably make inform that him. Clear. Yeah. You should probably inform him. I will. Him. I'll send him an email. You understand that if Subject. Dwight doesn't have a window seat. Subject Dwight window and seat. And also, he's a giant. And he's going to want a bed too, so he needs a chance to upgrade. You're going to need to get that ticket ASAP. Yeah, yeah. I'll inform him today. I'll I'll have a Zoom meeting with him about it. Okay, good, because okay. I'm not in the band. So anyway, we will check you guys later, and we'll see you on episode four. We appreciate you. Love you. Bye. It's the Dwight and Patty Show. It's the Dwight and Patty Show. It's the Dwight and Patty Show.